Mars has always managed to surprise us. But recently, NASA's Perseverance rover has found something even more bizarre than usual. It happened when it was exploring the Jezero crater, searching for signs of ancient life. At one point, Perseverance stumbled upon a weird rock that later was named Freya Castle. This rock is covered with bright black and white stripes, which makes it stand out against the red, dusty Martian landscape. Okay, we get it, the rock is kinda pretty, but what makes Freya Castle so special? At first glance, it resembles some types of metamorphic rocks you can find on Earth. Such rocks are formed deep within a planet's crust under intense heat and pressure, and it changes their composition and structure. But Mars doesn't have the same kind of tectonic activity we have on our home planet. It means that if Freya Castle is indeed metamorphic, it must have formed under unusual conditions. It could have been a massive impact or volcanic activity billions of years ago. Another theory claims that Freya Castle could be sedimentary. It means the rock was created from layers of material deposited by water or wind. Indeed, Mars once had liquid water flowing across its surface, especially in places like the Jezero Crater. It was a lake bed long ago. Now, if Freya Castle is sedimentary, it might have been altered by water, and it would explain its unique banding. Other experts believe that the rock could have undergone changes from hydrothermal activity. Hot, mineral-rich water could have been flowing through cracks, altering the rock's composition. This actually makes sense. The rock was found in a region that had once been submerged in water. Also, since Freya's castle is distinct from the underlying bedrock, it might have come from somewhere else. Perhaps it just rolled down the hill. So, scientists hope that as Perseverance continues to climb the mountain, it will find more rocks of this new type. But the coolest thing about this rock is that it could provide a glimpse into Mars's deeper geological processes. You see, the rock's pattern has been described as resembling boudinage. That's a French term used to describe a structure where layers of rock look like a chain of sausages. Boudinage forms when rocks are stretched and squeezed under high heat and pressure. And it could indicate that Freya Castle appeared deep beneath the Martian surface before it was pushed up or exposed by an impact. Another possibility is that Freya Castle is a sandstone that has been altered by the planet's winds combined with past water activity. If the rock was exposed to water, minerals like iron could have seeped in, creating the black and white striped effect. When sandstone is exposed to water or wind erosion, it can develop all sorts of interesting patterns, but no matter what kind of rock Freya Castle is, its presence in the Jezero Crater is crucial. Jezero itself is an ancient impact crater that dates back to about 3.8 billion years ago. At one point in the past, the crater was filled with water. It even has a river delta where sediments from flowing water settled. The main mission of Perseverance is to explore this region to look for evidence of past microbial life. Thus, every rock it comes across helps scientists piece together the puzzle of Mars' watery past. So how did Freya Castle end up in the Jezero Crater? One theory claims that an impact from a meteorite blasted the rock out from Mars' lower crust and deposited it in the crater. The rock could have also been flung across the Martian surface by the force of the impact. One more idea is that the rock was carried into Jezero by water during one of the periods when the crater was flooded. The slightly rounded edges of the rock confirm that it may have been tumbled and eroded by water, which is typical for rocks transported by flowing liquid. If it turns out that Freya Castle is indeed a metamorphic rock, it could be one of the oldest rock formations ever studied on Mars. And that would be a major breakthrough. It could give us some clues about the planet's early crust, and possibly even its ancient water systems. If the rock is as ancient as it seems, it might bear evidence of Mars's oldest hydrosphere or even some of the earliest signs of liquid water in our solar system. On the 30th of May, 2024, scientists made a shocking discovery. A rock that cracked open after NASA's Curiosity Mars rover drove over it revealed yellow sulfur crystals. It was something never seen on the red planet before. Starting from October 2023, Curiosity has been exploring an area rich in sulfates. That's a kind of salt that forms when water evaporates and contains sulfur. But in the past, all discovered rocks only had mixes of sulfur and other materials, while the rock found by the rover is made of pure sulfur. Now, most people associate sulfur with that yucky stench of rotten eggs, but in reality, elemental sulfur doesn't have any smell. 
it forms pretty rarely and needs very particular conditions. And scientists have never associated such conditions with that very location on the red planet. Now guess what? Curiosity then found an entire field of bright rocks similar to the one it had crashed, made of pure sulfur. Specialists explain that it's something that shouldn't be there. So now, they have to find a way to explain this phenomenon. It's just one of a few interesting findings Curiosity has made during its exploration of the Geddes Vallis Channel. That's a groove running down a slope of three mile tall Mount Sharp. The rover has been ascending the base of this mountain since 2014. Each layer of the mountain represents a certain period of the history of the Red Planet. And the main mission of Curiosity is to figure out when and where ancient Martian terrain could have provided nutrients for microbial life. Geddes Vallis had been spotted from space years before Curiosity was launched. This channel became one of the main reasons scientists wanted to visit this part of Mars. They believe that the channel might have been carved by flows of liquid water and debris. They supposedly left a ridge of boulders and sediment going two miles down the mount slide below the channel. Since Curiosity arrived at the channel earlier this year, researchers have been trying to figure out whether landslides or ancient floodwaters built up the large piles of debris rising from the channel's floor. The latest data from Curiosity hints that both factors played their own roles in this process. Some mounds look as if they were left by wild flows of water and debris, and others seem to result from local landslides. The thing is, stones carried by water flows got rounded like river rocks, and angular rocks are likely to have been deposited by dry avalanches. One more detail, water soaked all the material that settled in that area and the resulting chemical reactions bleached white halo shapes into some rocks. Over time, wind and sand erosion revealed those shapes. Researchers say that the period when it was all happening wasn't a quiet one for Mars. There was an astonishing amount of activity there. Multiple flows down the channel included severe floods and boulder-rich flows. All this evidence of water tells a more complex story than what scientists expected to find in that region. That's why they've been so eager to lay their hands on a rock sample from the channel. It would let them learn more about the history of that area. Well, on the 18th of June, they got their chance. The sulfur rocks were tiny and brittle, so they couldn't be sampled using the drill. But nearby, Curiosity found a large rock that was later nicknamed Mammoth Lakes. Rover engineers had to look for a part of the rock that could allow safe drilling. Luckily, there was a suitable parking spot on the loose, sloping surface of the rock. Curiosity bored its 41st hole with the help of a powerful drill. Then, the rover trickled the powderized rock into its belly for further analysis. This way, scientists will be able to figure out what material the rock was made of. Curiosity has already moved away from Mammoth Lakes. Now, the rover is off to search for other surprises the channel has prepared for us Earthlings. A giant volcano has been found near Mars's equator. It was literally hiding in plain sight. It's deeply eroded but active from ancient to recent times. There might even be remnants of glacier ice near its base. That's why this discovery might indicate a promising new location to search for life, as well as a potential destination for future human and robotic exploration. The discovery of a giant volcano and a possible sheet of hidden glacier ice was announced at the 55th Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in Texas. The volcano is located in the eastern part of Mars Tharsis Volcanic Province, between Labyrinth of the Night and Valleys of Mariner. The formation was actually repeatedly spotted by spacecraft orbiting Mars, but it's so deeply eroded that it was hard to recognize it for what it really was. The structure is still awaiting its official name. At the moment, it's referred to as the Noctis Volcano. It reaches a height of 29,600 feet and spans an impressive 280 miles across. Such a giant size indicates that the volcano has been active for a very long time. In its southeastern part, there's a thin recent volcanic deposit, and beneath, glacier ice might still be present. 
Scientists were examining the geology of the area where they had spotted the remains of a glacier the year before when they realized they were inside a volcano. Several clues gave away the volcanic origin of the eroded structure. For example, the area of the central summit has a few elevated mesas forming an arc. It reaches the highest point and then slopes downhill from the summit. The outer slopes extend out to 140 miles in different directions. The remains of a collapsed volcanic crater that used to host a lava lake are located near the center of the structure. Lava flows and deposits made of volcanic ash, cinders, pumice, and rock fragments ejected during eruptions, as well as hydrated mineral deposits, appear in several spots within the structure. In addition to the volcano, a large area of volcanic deposits within the volcano's perimeter has been found, too. It covers an area of 1,930 square miles and contains loads of low, rounded, elongated, blister-like mounds. Such terrain is believed to be a field of rootless cones, mounds produced by explosive steam venting or steam swelling. It happens when a thick cover of hot volcanic materials happens to rest on a water or ice-rich surface. The Noctis volcano seems to have a long and complicated history of modifications. They might have occurred because of the combination of fracturing and thermal and glacial erosion. Researchers believe the volcano could be a vast shield made of layers of pyroclastic materials, lava, and ice. The latter might have appeared due to snow and glaciers accumulating on the volcano's flanks through time. Eventually, fractures and faults developed in the region, probably due to the uplift of the Tharsis region on which the volcano sits. Lava started to rise through various parts of the volcano. It led to thermal erosion and the removal of huge amounts of hidden ice. Entire sections of the volcano collapsed. Glaciers continued the erosion process giving the numerous canyons crisscrossing the structure their peculiar shape. If this version is correct, then possible hidden sheets of glacier ice around the volcano might be the remains of the latest glaciation that impacted the Noctis volcano. And still, a lot about the newly discovered formation remains a mystery. It's obvious that it has been active for a long time and started to grow early in Mars's history, but it's unclear when exactly. Even though it erupted even in modern times, it's unknown if it's still volcanically active. Will it erupt again when people begin to colonize the red planet? And finally, if it has been active for a very long time, is it possible for the combination of constant warmth and water from ice to allow the site to harbor life? Recently, scientists have made an astounding discovery that can change the entire course of Mars exploration. Apparently, there are oceans of liquid water on the red planet, so the future looks bright. We could use this water to support future missions and then even relocate to Mars since we wouldn't need to worry about where to get this precious liquid, right? Well, there's one big problem. These oceans of liquid water are in Mars, so deep inside that we aren't likely to get there. At least that's what a new analysis of seismic data collected by the Mars InSight lander claims. Huge reserves of liquid water seem to be the best explanation for some seismic quirks of the red planet. So all this precious water is out of our reach. But we need to find it to solve the puzzle of the aquatic history of our blushing, dusty neighbor. And the first thing we need to do is identify where the water is and how much of it the planet is hiding. Navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration. Now our rovers are scurrying about on the surface of the red planet, gathering all the available data on the planet's surface geology. And it's getting increasingly obvious that Mars was once covered with water. Many factors, from Martian terrains to ancient dry lake beds and deltas, suggest that there was a time when the planet was quite soppy. These days, there's still some water on and right below the surface of Mars, but it's in the form of ice and nowhere near what Mars had in the ancient past. To understand how much of it could have been on the red planet billions of years ago, we must know where all this water went. There are two spots where the water could have gone – into space 
or toward the interior of Mars. Then it could have been isolated as either liquid reservoirs or ice deposits. Currently, we don't have any way of measuring how much water once leaked away. But now, we finally can find out more about the gooey center of the red planet. All thanks to the Mars InSight lander. It isn't operating anymore. But from November 2018 to December 2022, it was listening to the hums and rumbles and monitoring the activity below its feet. The thing is, acoustic waves generated by seismic activity deep inside the planet can change according to the composition and density of the material these waves are moving through. And scientists can get a lot of information analyzing the behavior of seismic waves. In this case, they used a model similar to those used to map underground oil fields and aquifers on our home planet. Then, with the help of this model, they analyzed the data gathered by InSight on Mars. They discovered that the best explanation could be that there was a layer of fractured rocks whose cracks were filled with water deep under the surface of the red planet. That layer could be at a depth of 7 to 12 miles. That's why it would be extremely tricky for future missions to get to it. And still, the new discovery could help us understand the Martian water cycle. Confirming the existence of a large reservoir of liquid water can help us sneak a peek at what the climate on Mars used to be or what it could be like one day. And if once Mars had a lot of water, it could have been habitable in the ancient past and might become habitable in the future. Water is crucial for life as we know it. So underground water reservoirs on the red planet could already be habitable. Maybe while we're talking, tiny microorganisms or even some tentacled creatures are living their lives in the comfort of their underground home. On Earth, super deep mines do host life. And the bottom of the ocean, with its immense unbelievable pressures, isn't lifeless either. So far, we haven't found any evidence of life on Mars. But for now, it sounds like this place has the potential to sustain life. Inside data has shown that there isn't likely to be a lot of water ice in the upper crust of the planet, at least in the region around the lander. But if it turns out that there is a water-rich layer deep below the surface and stretching around the entire globe of the planet, then there would be enough water to fill ancient ocean beds and even more. Now Mars isn't the only place outside Earth where there is water or where we might one day find water. Take the good old moon, for example. On Earth's natural satellite, water can be found all over the surface. But it's not the water you might be imagining. On the moon, water remains mostly as ice, and it's distributed unevenly. For example, the poles of the moon are the regions that never receive sunlight. This is the reason they're extremely cold. And it's no wonder there's a lot of ice there. The ice in these areas is often mixed with the lunar soil and hiding deep below the surface. Then there's Enceladus, the sixth largest moon of Saturn. In reality, it's not that large, just 314 miles across. In other words, this moon is small enough to fit inside Arizona. Ooh, we should try that! Well, interestingly, when the Cassini space probe first arrived at Saturn, researchers were expecting Enceladus to be a frozen ball of ice. But what they saw was plumes of icy particles and water vapor erupting from geysers on the moon's surface. It was clear that there was a massive ocean between the moon's rocky core and its icy shell. Then there's Jupiter's moon Europa. Scientists think that this world is one of the most promising places in the solar system when it comes to searching for new life forms. That's because Europa has a huge saltwater ocean as deep as 40 to 100 miles. And even though it's under a layer of ice that is likely to be 10 to 20 miles thick, it's still potentially habitable. Astronomers believe that plumes of water might erupt from cracks in the ice shell and release the contents of the moon's ocean into space. The temperature, pressure, and chemistry are very different on Europa. And astronomers aren't sure yet how the ice behaves there. That's the main reason they haven't figured out yet how deep or large the water reservoirs on Europa are and how long they need to refreeze. But out of all the places where we could find water in the universe, the most bizarre is probably open space. 
In 2011, two teams of astronomers discovered a cloud of water floating freely among stars. It was the largest and farthest reservoir of water ever detected. So this massive cloud of water vapor surrounds a black hole. But not just any black hole. This one's a quasar, located 12 billion light-years from Earth. The conditions around this quasar must be really special to create such an enormous amount of water. This cloud contains 140 trillion times the volume of all the water on Earth. That's enough to give every person on the planet a whole planet's worth of water 20,000 times over. Sounds wild, doesn't it? But there's something even cooler. Astronomers think this water cloud formed just 1.6 billion years after the universe began. This discovery is yet another sign that water has been around all over the universe, even in its early days. But here's the kicker. Until they found this, scientists had never detected water vapor so far back in time. Sure, there's water in our Milky Way galaxy, but most of it's frozen solid in ice. This discovery really pushes the boundaries of what we know about water in the universe. There are tons of weird things on Mars. Spoons, noodles, doors, even faces. Are they all really just rocks? Besides, it's not the only planet in our solar system full of mysterious things. Let's check them out. Recently, we found a strange thing on Mars that looks like a smooth, spoon-like object. It grabbed everyone's attention after NASA's Curiosity rover spotted it. The rock, with a handle and rounded tip, looks like it's floating in the rover's photo. People on the internet are puzzled about what it might be. Some are joking that it's a Martian's bowling pin, or even a shoehorn left by extraterrestrial creatures. But Andrew Good from NASA says it's not that exciting. Turns out it's just a rock shaped by the wind over a long time. These kinds of rocks with odd shapes are common on Mars. They're called ventifacts. Ventifact is a rock that can get scratched, dented, or smoothed out by tiny particles carried by the wind. You'll usually find these kinds of rocks in dry places where there's not much grass or trees to block the wind, and where there's a lot of sand blowing around. Sometimes, the wind can carve ventifacts into really cool shapes, like the mushroom rocks you can see in the White Desert National Park in Egypt. These rocks look like giant mushrooms because the wind wears away the bottom part faster than the top, making them stand tall and slim. Ventifacts aren't the only cool Martian rocks. Check out this series of surreal spikes protruding from the red surface. NASA's Curiosity rover stumbled upon them while exploring the Gale Crater on Mars. They quickly caught everyone's attention. Twisting structures resembling spikes looked like some extraterrestrial doors. Even the SETI Institute, an organization focused on searching for extraterrestrial life, tweeted about the image, referring to it as a cool rock. But in reality, these are just hoodoos. These tall and thin spires occur when hard rock sits atop softer rock layers. Martian spikes are likely cemented fillings of ancient fractures in sedimentary rock, with softer material eroded away over time. Again, there are many hoodoos on Earth, too. They're also called fairy chimneys or tent rocks. You can find them in places like Utah's Bryce Canyon and the Colorado Plateau. NASA is excited about these weird structures because they can help us learn more about the history of the Gale Crater. There was also a rock that looked like a jelly donut. We called this rock Pinnacle Island. It was spotted by NASA's cameras. However, just four days earlier, it was nowhere to be seen. So how did it magically disappear? In a very anticlimactic way, it was kicked up by one of Opportunity's wheels as it traversed the Martian terrain. But there's still some mystery surrounding that jelly donut. Analysis revealed that Pinnacle Island contains unusually high levels of sulfur and manganese. Both of these things are water-soluble. In other words, there might have been some water action that created these elements in the rock. So this tiny thing suddenly caused a lot of drama, and an entire lawsuit against NASA. It claimed that the agency failed to investigate a possible fungus growing on Mars. Mmm, jelly donut fungus. But not all our findings are natural. Another puzzling discovery was this thing the Perseverance rover spotted. 
It's something that looks like tangled spaghetti or a string. Just like the donut, this mysterious object showed up in a rover camera image and then vanished from the sandy ground in several days. It turns out that it could be debris from the rover's landing system. Perseverance landed in the Jezero crater in February 2021. It had a rough landing and accidentally scattered debris around. Some of these debris pieces have been showing up in the rover's images for a while now. The string-like object is likely a piece of shredded Dacron netting, which is a type of fiber used in thermal blankets. These blankets help regulate equipment temperatures during the super hot process of landing on Mars. It probably underwent significant unraveling and shredding due to strong forces during the landing. Thermal blankets lost a bunch of stuff back then. For example, this shiny foil piece spotted in June. The rover found it on a rock. What's remarkable is how far some of the debris has traveled. The rover landed about 1.2 miles away from where it's currently exploring. It's probably because the crash threw the debris into the air, and the Martian winds carried it over such a distance. Mars is known for its strong winds, which can move lightweight objects. However, while it's fun to stumble upon them on images, there are concerns about the debris and trash on Mars. We haven't even fixed this problem on Earth, and we're already creating it on Mars. The debris we left on the red planet is already accumulating in an area called Hogwallow Flats. Plus, the debris can accidentally contaminate the sample tubes used for collecting Martian rocks. So far, NASA isn't overly worried about this, but they're keeping a close eye on it to prevent any issues with the rovers. Now, how about not things, but animals? Curiosity caused quite a stir when it captured something that looked like a rat on Mars. Some started speculating that it could be evidence of indigenous Martian life, or even that this rodent was brought along by curiosity. But the Mars rat, once again, turned out to be just a weird rock. It looked interesting because of the natural processes like wind erosion and mechanical abrasion. We also found some worm-looking things. Curiosity snapped a picture of a formation that looks like worms wriggling across the Martian landscape. Despite its tiny size, this formation stands out with its unique shape and rough texture. It's probably made of durable material resistant to Mars's harsh erosion. And finally, our top mysterious finding is the face on Mars. Sidonia is a region on Mars that has captured both scientific and popular interest. It's located in Mars's northern hemisphere. It lies between heavily cratered regions to the south and relatively smooth plains to the north. There's a theory that the northern plains may have once been ocean beds. Maybe Sidonia was once a coastal zone. This place is full of interesting and beautiful features that tell us a lot about the history of the Red Planet. But its most interesting feature was the Martian face. This thing gained widespread attention when it was snapped by the Viking 1 orbiter in 1976. Some believe that it was evidence of a long-lost Martian civilization. At first, NASA dismissed it as a trick of light and shadow. But after some analysis, it turned out to be, yep, another rock. We also saw a face of a bear. It was captured by the high-resolution imaging experiment camera. In an image, we can see a circular fracture pattern that looks like a bear's head, with two craters forming the eyes and a V-shaped collapse structure like the nose. The head likely formed because something heavy settled on top of an old hole in the ground. This hole was filled with either lava or mud. The nose-like feature is speculated to be a volcanic or mud vent. But why do we keep seeing these strange things on Mars? Sometimes our brains can trick us into seeing things like faces or objects in rocks and other things. But these are just illusions called periodolia. Periodolia is a psychological phenomenon that makes us see familiar patterns or shapes, especially faces, where none actually exist. It's because the brain encounters something it doesn't recognize or understand right away. It tries to find things that look the most like this one. 
so it sees random patterns, textures, or sounds as something meaningful and recognizable. That's why a chair and clothes on it seems like a super creepy human-like figure at night. It also causes you to see faces or shapes in clouds, or hear recognizable sounds and even words in random noise. It's a fascinating proof of the power of our perception, but we also should be careful with it and not let our imagination run wild. You must have heard that humans were supposed to fly to Mars within the next 10 to 20 years, but now the mission seems to be at risk. A new study has revealed the dramatic effects that such a journey can have on the human body, and because of that, the entire plan is now at risk. Samples from over 40 missions, which involve both mice and humans, have shown that the conditions in space are likely to have an even more negative influence on our bodies than we thought. Both NASA and SpaceX are planning to send crewed missions to Mars in the coming decades, but new findings might put an end to these projects. Researchers at University College London have discovered that microgravity and galactic radiation in space cause serious health risks, and they become more and more pressing the longer someone is exposed to these conditions. Surprisingly, the body part at the highest risk is the kidneys. The research has shown that after less than a month in space, some parts of the kidneys show visible signs of shrinking. So before we go all the way to Mars, we'll need to develop measures to protect the kidneys and other parts of the body. This will allow astronauts who will take part of this mission to avoid irreversible damage to their health, which in turn means that future missions to Mars haven't been completely ruled out yet. The author of the study, Dr. Keith Sue, mentioned that they already knew about the issues that astronauts had after short space missions, like kidney stones for example, but they still don't know why such problems occur or what is going to happen to astronauts on much longer space flights, such as the planned mission to Mars. If they don't manage to develop new methods to protect the kidneys, astronauts who will eventually reach the Red Planet might need serious kidney treatment already on their way back. Unfortunately, the effects of radiation damage on kidneys appear pretty late. By the time they become apparent, it might be too late to prevent a kidney failure. This can be catastrophic, not only for the astronauts, but also for the entire mission's chances of success. Meanwhile, an astronaut on Mars is likely to receive up to 700 more daily radiation doses than those we get on our home planet. The Earth's magnetic field and atmosphere protect people from the non-stop bombardment of cosmic rays. These energetic particles travel close to the speed of light and can easily penetrate the human body. In space, astronauts aren't protected against this radiation as effectively as on Earth, which can increase the risk of many serious health issues during long missions. Damage to the human body can extend to the brain, heart, eyes and central nervous system. Physicists studying cosmic radiation explain that one day in space is equivalent to the amount of radiation one receives on Earth for a whole year. Moreover, most of the changes in the genes of the astronauts are likely to be the result of radiation exposure. That's what a recent NASA's twin study claims. It has shown DNA damage in astronaut Scott Kelly compared to his identical twin and fellow astronaut Mark Kelly, who remained on our planet. Another source of space radiation are the unpredictable solar particle events. They deliver high doses of radiation in short periods of time, which can lead to radiation sickness if astronauts don't take special protective measures. Even space flights orbiting close to the Earth, including the International Space Station, have highly adverse health effects. These days, research communities are focused on musculoskeletal, neurological, ocular and cardiovascular degeneration, and these issues can appear as soon as a few weeks into a mission. At the same time, the effects of low Earth orbit flies are less clear when we talk about other organs. More research is definitely needed. We've been dreaming about life on Mars for a long time. Not only about growing potatoes there in the future, but also about all the potatoes that could have been there in the past. Has there ever been life on Mars? Recently, scientists have found something that could be evidence of that. Let's find out what happened. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun. A human hasn't set foot on Mars yet, but robots have set their wheels. The first spacecraft that visited the Red Planet were NASA Viking landers. They flew there back in 1976 and sent us a lot of interesting data. Back then, we didn't know anything about Mars. To us, it looked like a cold, lifeless desert. But since we're so similar, scientists began to wonder, has it always been like this? Or is it possible that once Mars used to be thriving and full of life? And in 2022, NASA's Mars rover Perseverance found something that could shed a light on this mystery. But first of all, what is Perseverance? Scientists have suggested that if there was life on Mars once, 
It's unlikely that it could simply disappear without a trace. It must have left some traces, perhaps underground, where they would be protected from radioactive solar tantrums and other nastiness. So we need to check the rocks. It's important to note that we aren't looking for life on Mars right now. There most likely isn't any. Instead, we want to look into the distant past of our twin planet. We're talking billions of years ago, when Mars could have been warm, green, and far from lifeless. In other words, we have to find dead microbes and various chemical compounds similar to ones on the Earth. This is the mission of our main character, Perseverance. It arrived on Mars in February of 2021. The spacecraft landed on the bottom of the 30-mile-wide Jezero crater, and after landing, it scooted over to the west, to the place that prompted scientists to choose Jezero for research. This place is a dried-up river delta, and this former river is already more than 3.5 billion years old. The Jezero crater itself was once a large lake. Yup, apparently there was life on Mars and scientists have suggested that these places would be perfect as bodyguards of microbes. That's exactly what bacteria do on Earth. They hide, being still in the depths of lakes and ponds. So we could probably find traces there. The researchers believe that this particular lake has the highest scientific value in the entire mission. The highest chance to find rocks on which such bacteria could survive is here in Jezero. So, Perseverance went to the delta. The row wasn't easy, though. The rover missed a little and landed further than planned. As one famous movie said, this little maneuver is going to cost us 51 years. Fortunately, Perseverance took only one year, and on the way, it was able to explore Jezero a little. The rover uses a complex built-in tool to explore the world. The tool is called Scanning Habitable Environments with Raman and Luminescence for Organics and Chemicals, or just Sherlock. Boy, NASA sure loves its acronyms. As the device approached the delta, the signal of organic molecules became stronger. Soon, these signals were everywhere, and besides, they were the brightest that the scientists have ever seen. What does it mean? Elementary, my dear Watson. You know, Sherlock. It's time to dig! Since July 2021, Perseverance has drilled and collected four thin cores of sedimentary rock. The total number of collected rocks at the moment is 12. This is the first time in history that we're collecting something like this on another planet. These four cores were found on two rocks called Skinner Ridge and Wildcat Ridge. The first pair of cores, the ones from the Skinner Ridge, don't seem very interesting at first glance. They're quite close to what we can find in many places on Earth. However, if we look at them closer, we'll see that they're dotted with round grains of some dark material. These dark grains could have once been deposited on them by an ancient river, the same one that flowed into Jezero. It's possible that the river brought them from places hundreds of miles away from Jezero. And that's pretty cool. If we study these cores, we'll be able to learn even more about the far corners of Mars. Well, there are no corners on it, but you get the idea. Then, in April 2022, Perseverance did arrive at the Delta. And then scientists finally found what they were looking for. The discovery, to put it mildly, excited them. They found two more cores, which held organic substances. This pair was taken from the Wildcat Ridge. It's found very close to the Skinner Ridge, but the two rocks are quite different from each other. These samples are lighter in color and more uniform. Most likely, they're mudstone, an unusual rock similar to clay, but harder and unable to absorb water. They're also finer grain than the cores of the Skinner Ridge. Why does it matter? Because the finer the grains in the stone, the more likely it is that there may be some traces of a past life in it. On Earth, Fine-grained stones most often lie on the bottoms of ponds and in similar places. There, they can preserve the remains of dead organisms and similar stuff for years. And this is exactly what we found on them. Additionally, according to scientists, there was more organic matter in these two cores than in any other place studied by Perseverance so far. It probably accumulated there while the lake was gradually evaporating billions of years ago. So. There really was life on Mars? Well, let's slow down a little. 
Organic substances are molecules holding carbon. And yes, on Earth, they're most often associated with life, but not always. Sometimes they can form as a result of other things. Therefore, we cannot say for sure whether there was life on Mars. We don't know if these molecules really remain from some Martian microbes, or if they're the result of some other things. But the discovery is still very significant. We have to literally keep digging this way. To learn more about this organic matter, scientists need to collect a couple more samples of fine-grained rock. It would also be great to study the material lying around these former reservoirs. Perseverance has already moved to another area, to a place with a beautiful name, Enchanted Lake. Now it needs to look for similar things there. It will also continue to study Lake Jezero. Eventually, Perseverance will climb to the top of the delta and then continue exploring ancient sites outside the crater. Sometime before the end of 2022, Perseverance will probably have six or more samples of the Martian cores. Unfortunately, its tools, though complex, are quite limited. This data alone won't be enough for us to get a complete picture. Therefore, NASA plans to send other spacecraft to Jezero in the coming years. Together with the European Space Agency, they're working on the next robotic mission, known as the Mars Sample Return. The name speaks for itself. These devices will arrive and take away all the test tubes from the old Prospector Perseverance. After that, these samples will be delivered to Earth, though not by Amazon Prime, and then scientists will be able to analyze them in advanced laboratories. However, all this will take a really long time. The launch of this mission is scheduled for 2027-2028, and the spacecrafts won't be able to return until 2033. But if everything goes well, it will be the first samples in history delivered to Earth from Mars. In other words, there's still enough space for research, literally. And yes, we don't yet know the true meaning of these finds. But that's why the entire mission was created, right? And who knows? Maybe in a few years we'll finally find out the truth about what happened on Mars billions of years ago. Ooh, check out the Martian! Made you look. Made you look. NASA made this cool rover called Curiosity and sent it to Mars to see what else we can find out about the red planet, the one that will possibly become our next home. Curiosity has been exploring the surface of Mars, taking measurements, and gathering data about the planet for more than 10 years. And good old Curiosity stumbled upon some interesting wave-rippled rocks in the region of the Martian surface that was kind of expected to be drier. Scientists believe this area was actually a lake bed. It might be the bottom of a dried-up lake and all that sediment and other things that have accumulated there. All this can give us some important clues about the history of the lake. For instance, the types of organisms that might have lived there, how deep the lake was, how long it was there, and similar stuff. These wave-rippled patterns tell us that these rocks may have formed when strong Martian winds were moving the water in this big ancient lake. You know that specific sound you can hear when you're holding a seashell to your ear? You actually hear it because of the way the air gets trapped inside the shell and moves against its walls. The air cannot escape, so it vibrates at frequencies that depend on the size of the shell. In other words, you have a feeling you hear the sound of waves hitting ashore. That's Mars in my imagination now, a spot where you can still hear the long-lost sound of waves crashing against the shores of mysterious gigantic lakes. During its mission, Curiosity also came across a metallic object which turned out to be a meteorite. This unusual rock that came from space is made of nickel and iron. Its name is Cacao, and it's about the size of a small car, 6.5 feet long, and weighs over a ton. This is an important discovery, because we don't often find metallic objects on the Martian surface. Most of the rocks there are made of basalt or some other volcanic materials, so that chunk of metal could tell us more about the history of Mars and how it formed. Plus, it definitely stands out. 
the surface of Mars is red from oxides, while cacao is metallic-looking and dark gray. It's rounded and smooth, too, which means it once passed through Mars' atmosphere. There have been other robots exploring Mars, too. For instance, NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter MRO, stumbled upon circular sand dunes. Sand dunes are usually very common on the red planet. They come in many different shapes and sizes, but circular ones like these are really rare. They consist of dark sand with light-colored material surrounding them. And the cool thing is that these dunes are arranged in a specific pattern, similar to the spokes of a wheel. It could be because of the way the winds blow. But back to our buddy, Curiosity. It's been exploring many other interesting things, like oxygen levels in the Martian atmosphere. The levels change depending on the season. There's more oxygen in the spring and summer. It's still not clear why, though. And of course, even that is not enough for us to really breathe there. The concentration of oxygen on Mars is 0.1%, which is about 100 times less than the concentration in Earth's atmosphere. The atmosphere of Mars is mostly made up of carbon dioxide, with traces of other gases. Curiosity was so good that it also decided to analyze the age of rocks it found. It seems they're much older than we previously thought. Some of them date back more than 3 billion years. Curiosity found organic molecules in soil samples, too. These molecules are basically building blocks of life. Now, this doesn't prove there's indeed life on Mars. It's just one of the things that suggest there might have been some form of life a long time ago. Curiosity discovered potential evidence that there might be a large reservoir of liquid water beneath the south polar ice cap, probably very salty and full of different minerals. This high salinity is the reason why this water could remain liquid at temperatures well below freezing. It would be cool to have some sort of subsurface ocean to take a dip in, especially when these crazy Martian winds are raging on the surface. And it would be great to have something that would protect us from those insane radiation levels on the red planet. There are some pretty toxic chemicals and salts in the Martian soil, which can be really bad for humans. Astronauts could potentially end up being exposed to these toxic chemicals, either through direct contact with the soil or by inhaling dust that contains these salts. Also, these substances could be a problem for growing crops. This is a really big discovery for long-term missions to Mars, because astronauts would need to be able to grow their own food so they can survive while there. Another thing that favors the idea of potential life on Mars is discovering methane there. Methane is a very important finding because, usually, living organisms produce this gas. So where did it come from if not from them? In reality, there are a few possible explanations for that. One is the geological activity of underground reservoirs. Another idea is that meteorites brought methane to the red planet. What's interesting is that levels of methane are higher in particular areas. So, yeah, I don't know about you, but I'll stick to the theory that it comes from living organisms. Now, it's possible that volcanoes on Mars are still active. We know there are many extinct volcanoes on the red planet, but we've never found enough evidence to prove that some of them are still alive. Scientists studied volcanic deposits and found out that some volcanoes could have erupted maybe 50,000 years ago. Before that, Everyone thought the last eruption happened 3 to 4 billion years ago. If you could compress the geological history of Mars into just one day, this would be like having an eruption a second ago. So, you never know. There might still be magma bubbling in secret under the Martian surface. All the future generations that might end up building their life there could really have some fun. Mars turned into a cold and barren place that can't really support life over time. And one of the main reasons for that was losing its atmosphere. The red planet used to have a much thicker atmosphere, similar to Earth's. One major reason for that is its relatively weak magnetic field. 
Earth's magnetic field helps protect our atmosphere from the solar wind, a stream of charged particles that comes from the Sun. Without this protection, Mars had nothing to help it confront this insanely strong force that eventually took away most of its atmosphere. Another factor that played a big role in the loss of Mars's atmosphere is its relatively low gravity. Because Mars has weaker gravity than Earth, it's easier for gas molecules to escape into space. So Mars probably used to be more similar to our home planet. But with its current thin atmosphere, it can't keep any heat, which makes it very cold and very complicated for us to explore. But maybe it's better for us that we didn't visit the red planet back in its old times. There's this story about an ancient mega-flood that might have happened there. So yes, the red planet probably used to be a wetter and more hospitable place than it is today, with beautiful flowing rivers and amazing lakes, ponds, and other bodies of water. And some research showed evidence of large channels carved into the planet's surface. These channels are way bigger than any we previously found on the planet. They suggest this mega-flood happened billions of years ago. Perhaps it happened as a result of different factors, like volcanic activity, melting ice, and the release of carbon dioxide from the planet's crust. The flood may have created some temporary pools of water, too. Hopefully, it will mean more interesting clues for finding traces of microbial life. How about that? So imagine being one of the first people sent to explore Mars. As you're approaching the red planet, something strange and creepy draws your attention. There, yes, right there. Doesn't it look like a mammoth bear's head? What or who could possibly create a bear's snout in the middle of a crater? Unfortunately, or should I say luckily, there's nothing mysterious about the bear's head. It's just a facial pareidolia. That's a tendency to see facial features in everyday things. Hmm. But speaking about the finding on Mars, should we rename the phenomenon into Beridolia? You could see that coming, couldn't you? Alright, check it out. You see a V-shaped hill that looks like a nose. Then there are two craters that look like eyes. And then there's a circular fracture pattern, the head, that surrounds the nose and the eyes. Experts think that the face could be created when a deposit was settling over a buried impact crater. And the nose might be a mud or volcanic vent with solidified lava or mud flows around it. Anyway, the crater does look like a bear's face, I'll give you that. But thanks to HiRISE, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter's high-resolution imaging science experiment camera, another of NASA's amazing acronyms, we've seen many other crazy craters on the red planet. Like smiley faces, a bird, or an elephant. First, let's have a look at the famous face of Mars. These images were first taken by the Viking orbiter in 1976. At that time, the resolution was obviously quite poor, plus the lighting was slanted, which produced the result that shocked people in the 1970s – a face carved of rock staring back at Earth. Did it mean there was another civilization on Mars that had created this monument? Nah. Look at the photo of the same spot taken by the current Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. The resolution is much, much better, and the face has miraculously turned into an ordinary hill. Or look at this teeny Bigfoot, whose image was captured in 2008. I say teeny because this creature is just a few inches tall. And when the photo was taken, Bigfoot was only several yards away from the camera. And here, one curious soul zoomed in on a small rock and spotted something that resembled a gorilla. That's how some people started to believe there were apes on Mars. Yeah, really. Let me show you some more examples of imaginary creatures and faces on the red planet. Most of them come from a series of images taken by the Themis camera. Currently, it's on board the Mars Odyssey spacecraft, which only needs two hours to orbit the red planet, carrying some important scientific instruments. Let me introduce my happy Martian to you. This two-mile-wide crater was photographed in 2008. The next crater chain looks like a wasp with its wispy wings of impact debris. The whole feature was probably created by a meteorite that fell at a very low angle and broke into pieces right before the impact. Now, do you see a woolly mammoth or an elephant here? Lava flows in one region on Mars left this image on its reddish soil. 
The region itself, called Elysium Planitia, is famous for the planet's youngest lava flows. For example, the one that looks like a mammoth most likely formed in the past 100 million years. Eh, just yesterday. Now let's talk about love. Or rather, its symbol, the heart. Do you like these two hearts on the surface of the red planet? This one is actually a mesa top outlined by frost. And this heart shape is an impact crater. The hit tore away dark surface material and exposed lighter soil underneath. Then some of the material probably flew downslope, creating the heart. And this dust-covered hummingbird, can you see its long beak and head? Scientists aren't sure how this shape was formed, but they think erosion and wind played a part in its creation. These dark sand dune deposits look like a howling wolf. And here, can you see a series of interlocking gears? This image looks like the letter T, right? The right angle fracture was created by the tectonic stretching of the Martian crust. Do you think we might find other letters of the alphabet on Mars, too? Why not? And now, how about another bizarre thing astronomers noticed on the surface of Mars? Is that a door to someone's house? It was NASA's Curiosity rover that sent this image to Earth. It became viral because this formation over here, see, looks like a door. Unfortunately, scientists, due to their rational minds, were quick to disappoint us. They claimed that it was just a natural part of the Martian landscape. There were several clues that made them think it wasn't a real door. For example, the opening is tiny, a mere 3 feet high. They're sure that what looks like a door is actually an opening in a rock created by natural forces, like winds and erosion. If you look at the rock closely, you may notice strata. Those are layers of silt that stand out because they're harder than the surrounding material. These strata dip here on the left and a bit higher on the right. They likely appeared around 4 billion years ago in a river or a windblown dune. Since the strata became visible, powerful Martian winds have eroded them even more. And look at this! See those cracks? That's how rocks weather on the red planet. This small cave probably formed when several fractures crossed the strata. A pretty large boulder might have fallen out under its own weight. And this created the door-shaped opening. This theory is quite plausible. Because even though the gravity on Mars isn't as strong as on Earth, it's still strong enough to do it. Besides, see that rock to the right of the opening? It has a suspiciously smooth vertical edge. It must be the culprit. It probably fell out not so long ago. But it's not only the red planet that can boast of having unusual formations. Let's take this comet, for example. This image was taken by the European spacecraft Rosetta in 2014. Can you see a face on its right-hand side? Or the moon? Here's its famous rabbit. It sits upside down, with its ears pointing downward. Some people see a man on the moon. It can either be his face or the entire body. If someone sees the whole human figure, it usually looks like it's carrying sticks. Sometimes, it's a toad. To spot it, look at the top left-hand side of our moon. The toad is facing upward, see? Now look at this spinning neutron star. Such a star is a collapsed core of a supergiant star with a total mass of 10 to 25 solar masses. Except for black holes and some hypothetical objects, like quark stars or white holes, neutron stars are the densest and smallest known stellar objects. Anyway, back to this particular star. As you can see, this space object, located 17,000 light-years away from Earth, is surrounded by a cloud of energetic particles. And this image, taken by NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory, appeared in 2009 and became viral in no time. All because many people spotted a hand-like structure among all that space stuff. NASA explained that the star was spinning incredibly fast, spewing energy into the space surrounding it. This created intriguing and complex structures, like the large cosmic hand so many people see. Now, look at the Horsehead Nebula in the constellation Orion. This is a freezing cold and dark cloud of dust and gas that was first noted in 1888. This dark shadowing is created by dust. And at the base of the nebula, there are many bright spots. Those are young stars at the stage of formation. Pay attention to this extremely bright star in the top left side of the horse head. Its radiation is so powerful that the star is starting to erode the cloud around itself. It means that, in millions of years, the nebula might not resemble the head of a horse anymore. Well, I won't be around then. 
The European Southern Observatory Very Large Telescope has captured an image in which we can see the collision of three different galaxies. We can even observe the effect they have on each other. But the coolest thing is that, while colliding, they created a recognizable shape. Because doesn't it look like a giant space hummingbird? Imagine a world where the red, barren landscape of Mars is transformed into a lush and verdant garden. A world where water flows freely, carving canyons and creating lakes and oceans. Can we achieve such a world by pouring the Earth's water onto the surface of Mars? And don't rush to say no, let's explore this possibility. All right, let's say we could magically transport all of the water on Earth to Mars. This supersized game of water pong would be crazy in both engineering and logistics. So how do we even do that? First of all, we're talking about millions and millions of gallons of water, which is no small feat. We would need some really big tanks to get all this water off the Earth. We would also have to figure out how to launch it all into space. This would require some serious rocket technology, as well as a lot of fuel. We could probably create an entire fleet of spacecraft specifically designed for the task. Just imagine that! A fleet of giant water tankers packed with tons of carefully harvested water blasting off from Earth's surface and hurtling through space at unimaginable speeds. Wouldn't that be a cool sight? Now another way. Probably a better one would be to launch a large number of smaller missions over time, each carrying a smaller amount of water until enough of it has been transported to Mars. So, let's say we manage to do all that. What happens next? After we get to Mars, we'd need to distribute this water all across the planet. We could use a network of underground pipes or some special drones to transport the water to different locations. This is just some basic things, and as you can see, we already need a lot of planning and resources. Moreover, a crazy operation like this would require a massive coordinated effort from scientists, engineers, and space agencies all over the world. And let's not forget about the costs. No wonder that scientists don't really consider it a viable plan. But the scale of this operation isn't the only problem. Hypothetically, let's say that we figured all that out and poured the Earth's water on Mars. Now what? Well, believe it or not, it would be almost completely useless. Our main challenge will be the atmosphere and current climate of Mars. Mars is a dry desert with an atmosphere that's only about 1% as thick as Earth's. This means that any water poured onto the surface would quickly evaporate. It would be pretty hard to create a stable environment when the entire lake can go poosh in a matter of seconds. And if the water doesn't evaporate, then, on the contrary, it will turn into ice. Mars's surface temperature is well below freezing. Thin atmosphere only makes things worse. Another challenge is that Mars has a very weak magnetic field, which means it has little protection from the solar wind. Solar wind is a stream of charged particles that are constantly flowing out from the sun. These winds are pretty dangerous. They can strip away any water that's put on the Mars surface. Also, the solar radiation on Mars is much stronger than on Earth. This would make it even more difficult to maintain any liquid water there. And finally, don't forget that we also need to purify this water to remove all the bacteria before drinking it. But let's not give up. If we stay super optimistic, we can still try to solve these problems. Basically, we need to find a way to maintain liquid water in one place for a long time and make sure that it doesn't freeze or evaporate. So how do we do it? There are a few ways we can go about it. Number 1. Insulation We could wrap all the water containers in insulation materials, like foam for example, or some reflective materials that can help to keep the water from freezing. Number 2. Heating We could use various heaters and devices to keep the temperatures above freezing, even thermal blankets. Although this would require a lot of energy and would be a difficult task. Number 3 underground reservoirs. We could dig a large hole and cover it with a transparent material to allow sunlight to pass through. This would help keep the water warm and insulated. Number 4. Salinity. Adding a small amount of salt or other dissolved minerals to water can lower its freezing point. 
Although, we'll need much more salt for things like lakes, and this method isn't the most efficient. And finally, number five, building a greenhouse. We could build a greenhouse or some other structure that can trap heat and create a more Earth-like environment. This option is probably the best one. After all, a greenhouse would also help us to grow various plants or other organisms. Yay, life! All right, great. Let's say we've discovered some way to store water on Mars and keep it there in a liquid, lukewarm state. What now? What impact would this have on Mars? Actually, this would be great. If we were to pour all this water on Mars, it could have drastically changed the climate of this cold, red desert. First of all, we could create a so-called greenhouse effect. It's when gases in a planet's atmosphere trap heat, causing the planet's temperature to rise. And yeah, this is pretty bad for Earth, but for Mars, whose temperatures jump between 70 and negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit, it would be awesome. This could cause the atmosphere to thicken and lead to the melting of the polar ice caps. Wouldn't that be awesome? Mars would begin to gradually turn from a lonely desert into Earth 2.0. It also means that the planet's atmosphere will change. For example, the weather patterns. Clouds could form on Mars, rains would begin to fall. And rains, as we know, transfer water from one region to another, which would mean they could water plants if they appeared on Mars. But all of this is pure speculation. We can't be completely sure what kind of impact pouring water on the Martian surface would have on the planet's climate. Perhaps, to create this greenhouse effect, we would need much more water than what we can transport. But if despite all these challenges, we had succeeded with our mission and made Mars much warmer and moist, could life have been finally born there? Um, unfortunately, that would still be pretty unlikely. Yes, water is very important for creating life, but that's not all we need. The composition of the Martian soil isn't very conducive to supporting life. The soil is mostly made of minerals called regolith, which are composed mainly of dust, sand, and other materials that aren't very good for plants. Theoretically, we could terraform Mars. Terraforming is a gradual, slow change of the planet so that it becomes suitable for our life, but this would be a very complex, long, and costly process. Oh, and by the way, what would happen to our Earth after all that? We took quite a lot of water, didn't we? From Earth's perspective, transporting water to Mars would require an enormous amount of resources, including energy and different materials. And the amount of water we'd have to spend would be staggering. The loss of such a large amount of water from Earth's own reserves could have a significant impact on our planet especially in areas where water is already scarce. So basically, this is a really bad idea, no matter how you look at it. Yeah, it may sound interesting, but it's not a viable plan at all. It would require too many resources, too much money, and it wouldn't even be worth it. That's why scientists and space agencies don't consider this idea seriously. Besides, there are many other more realistic and achievable goals in the field of Mars exploration. For example, we can keep studying the planet's geology, atmosphere, and potential for past or present life. These studies would help us to find some resources that could support future human exploration. Overall, we need to answer many more questions about Mars before we even begin to consider colonizing it. So let's keep an eye on scientific news and updates. <laughs> How many people do we need to create a new civilization? And not on Earth, but on Mars and in limited conditions. And if we create this colony and send them off, what problems will they face? How can they survive that far away from home without any support? A recent scientific study sheds light on these questions, so let's take a look at it. All right, so you want to colonize Mars, right? Well, it's not an easy task. Mars is the fourth most distant planet from the Sun and the seventh largest in the solar system. This lonely red guy is very similar to our Earth. Moreover, before it became a boundless desert, it could well have even looked like Earth now. Millions of years ago, there was water, oceans, plants, and who knows, maybe even life. 
It would be nice to put all these cool things back there. No wonder we've been talking about colonization of this planet for a very long time. Now, SpaceX claims that their proposed interplanetary spacecraft could deliver 100 people to Mars. The owner of the company, billionaire Elon Musk, talked about creating a fleet that could provide a constant flow of resources to Mars. But how realistic are all these fantasies? Actually, not very much. Before sending people to Mars, we need to solve a number of issues. For example, the incredible radiation exposure, toxic soil, low gravity, low temperatures, and all sorts of other nasty things. And this is just the beginning. It will take at least a couple of decades to create a vehicle that can actually successfully land on Mars and return back. But let's do a thought experiment and imagine that we finally decided to colonize Mars. How will things turn out? Recently, scientists published a new study on this topic. This study is called Minimum Number of Settlers for Survival on Another Planet. The author is Jean-Marc Salotti, professor at the National Polytechnic Institute of Bordeaux in France. His article was published in the Scientific Reports Journal. As you might have guessed, the study was trying to find out how we could colonize another planet. How many resources do we need? How should this colony live? What kind of work should they do? And how long will it take? And, of course, exactly how many people do we need for all of this? Let's try to answer that. Now, imagine that we've moved into a wonderful future. Well, not really. A terrible future, actually. In his study, Salotti suggested that life on Earth was threatened by some catastrophic event. So the only way for humanity to survive is to go to Mars or some other planet. In this imaginary scenario, unfortunately, the supply delivery from Earth was interrupted, or even gone. Now, the colony has to support itself somehow. Well, here's where we already stumble upon a bunch of problems. For example, we're not sure how well the people in the colony will work together. Will they communicate with each other like normal human beings? Will they share their time and resources as they should? Humans are constantly ruining things for other humans. I can even bet that it was their fault we had to flee to Mars. But even if we forget about that, how about organizational issues? What equipment do we have? What will we use to extract resources? What skills would we need? You know what? Who cares? In our case, these things don't matter. All that we know is that the colony doesn't have a lot of initial resources and equipment, and the human factor is absolutely unpredictable. So the chances of survival are pretty low, but we need to survive somehow. In this case, Salotti describes two things that will have a huge impact on our survival. These things are essentially variables in a mathematical equation. The first one is the availability of local resources. Basically, it means water, oxygen, and all sorts of useful chemical elements. These resources should be somehow mined and easy to use. Fortunately, we're not starting from scratch. We already know a lot about Mars. What resources are there? How can they be used for life support, agriculture, and industrial production? The colony is lucky because all this has been studied at various seminars and published in reports and books over the past years. Thanks to this, we know what will be available to our colony. For example, we know that gases could be extracted from the atmosphere and minerals from the soil. On Mars, we could provide such things as iron, glass and even organic compounds. The most important problem here is the service life of the equipment that our new Martians start with. They'll have to get as many materials as possible before the tools break. Keeping them in good condition will be almost the most important task. The second thing is the production capacity, or the speed of work. We have a specific list of things we need to do, make some tools for example, and all this must be produced in sufficient quantities before the literal deadlines. Salotti says that the most important thing here will be the so-called sharing factor. Imagine one person trying to survive on Mars. They would have to do all the tasks on their own. They would need to find or build their own system for supplying drinking water, oxygen, and electricity generation. We've already seen how this played out in the movie The Martian. 
This task wasn't easy at all. There's always not enough time, and all this is just too much for one person to handle. Unless you're Matt Damon, of course. So, surprisingly, we need a fairly large colony. This significantly distributes the burden. Each person spends less effort, gets tired less, and, as a result, the efficiency and speed of work grow. This is where the sharing factor comes into play. Now we need to calculate this number. If we want, for example, to build something, how many people do we need to do this quickly and efficiently? How can we optimize the work as much as possible? Well, it depends on the needs of these people, on available resources, random things like weather and so on. But in general, this number can be estimated and calculated using some mathematical functions. Salati tells in more detail about these functions in his article. You can read it yourself if you're interested, but in general, he describes five areas that need to be taken into account when calculating this number. These areas are ecosystem management, energy production, industry, buildings, and the human factor. The human factor includes such things as the upbringing and education of children, sports, games, music, and so on. In the end, it all comes down to two things, how much time we have and how well the people in the colony will work with each other. So, what was the result of all these calculations? In the end, Salati found out that we would need at least 110 people to successfully survive on Mars. This is the minimal number needed to create a self-sufficient civilization. And it will be better if we don't take too many people with us. The more people we take on the spacecraft, the more difficult it will be to predict the results. After all, as we've already said, humans are always ruining things for other humans. So it's better to stick with about 110 people. Of course, this is a rough estimate and there are a bunch of different assumptions and uncertainties, but even this number is already very useful. Now the scientists know how many people is a minimum for colonization of another planet. Colonizing other planets is a very complex issue, and it will take us a very long time to resolve it. It's very unlikely that we'll fly to Mars in the near future. This task may take several decades, or even a century. Therefore, the best solution would be to try our best to save Earth until we can begin to conquer other planets. Ah, uh, what a nice cosmic family. Meet Mars. I bet you've met him before. These two little guys are Phobos and Deimos, Mars' small moons. But it seems like Mars isn't treating the little ones the right way. Phobos and Deimos are believed to be captured asteroids. However, Phobos is gradually moving closer to Mars due to gravity and it is predicted that it will eventually be destroyed by the planet's gravity within the next 35 million years. I won't be around then. So, I imagine this will result in a ring of debris around Mars, similar to Saturn's rings. However, this process is a natural phenomenon and not an act of destruction by Mars. Apparently, Phobos is getting ripped apart by the crazy gravitational forces of the red planet. But wait, there's more! Phobos has these crazy parallel grooves all over its surface. We used to think that they were from an asteroid crash, but now scientists think they're actually from Mars's intense gravity pulling the moon apart. Talk about a rough ride! Scientists have this wild idea that when a little guy like Phobos gets too close to a big guy like Mars, it starts to stretch out towards it. They call it the tidal force. Phobos is predicted to get stretched out so much that it'll actually break apart. Crazy, right? And the debris from the Moon will form a tiny ring around Mars, just like Saturn's rings. Now, some people thought that Phobos's tiger stripes were caused by tidal forces before, but that theory got shut down because the Moon is just too darn fluffy. But now, these genius researchers ran some computer simulations and found out that maybe there's a hard shell underneath all that fluff that could create grooves on the surface. But don't worry. At the rate Phobos is going, it's going to crash into Mars in about 40 million years. But if tidal forces are already tearing it apart, it might not even last that long. However, we'll still have the chance to learn more about Phobos. NASA just picked 10 rock star researchers from all over the US to join the science working team for JAXA's Martian Moons Exploration, or just MMX mission. 
As NASA-supported participating scientists, they'll be helping JAXA explore the two Martian moons, Phobos and Deimos. And get this, they're even planning to land on Phobos and grab a surface sample. The mission is set to launch in 2024, and we'll get our hands on that sample in 2029. Seven of the lucky researchers will be using the MMX flight instruments to conduct their research. Phobos is a real oddball. It's only 17 miles wide and orbits Mars at a distance of 3,728 miles, to be precise. Now that's way closer than Earth's moon, which takes a whole 27 days to orbit us. But Phobos is in a death spiral toward Mars and is slowly falling towards the planet's surface at a rate of 6 feet every 100 years. But there must be a reason why Mars is acting that nastily, right? What if it's all just because of plain vengeance? Well, okay, picture this. Mars is minding its own business, being all hot and watery like a young Earth. It's got a sweet magnetic field that's protecting it from cosmic radiation and keeping its atmosphere nice and thick. Hey, life is good. But then, at least 20 asteroids, each the size of a small country, come crashing down on Mars like a giant game of cosmic whack-a-mole. One of them even leaves a crater that's almost 2,000 miles wide. Now imagine how Mars must feel with two asteroids being its moons after what other asteroids did to the red planet. All these impacts are like a massive punch to Mars's gut, and its already weak magnetic field is knocked out cold. The core gets all overheated and can't circulate properly, which means no more magnetic field to protect the planet. It's like as if you were wearing nothing at the depth of the Mariana Trench. If it were possible, you'd be defenseless and chilly. It's basically what happened to Mars. So now poor Mars is out there in the cold, unprotected from all those nasty cosmic rays. It's like going outside without sunscreen. Not a good idea. But at least we can learn from Mars's mistakes and make sure Earth doesn't have the same fate. Maybe we should start investing in some asteroid insurance. <laughs> but trust me, the red planet isn't mean at all. It's actually pretty friendly. While Mars may seem to be pretty tough for Phobos, there's something that might be thriving with Mars's help. So get this, a team of scientists found a way to grow rice on Mars. Yep, you heard me right. They used MMS, not the outdated way to send pictures, but a special soil called Mojave Mars Simulant. It's supposed to mimic Martian soil. And here's the catch, Martian soil has these nasty percolate salts that can be toxic for plants. So the team grew three types of rice, one normal and two gene-edited with mutations that make them better at handling stress like drought or salinity. And guess what? The mutant strains were able to root in soil with one gram of percolate per kilometer. Take that, Martian soil. But hold up. The rice grown in the MMS didn't turn out as great as the ones grown in regular potting soil. So the team decided to mix a quarter of the potting soil with the Martian simulant, and looky there, the plants started developing better. Now these scientists aren't just thinking about feeding Martians. They also want to see if their findings can help grow crops in places on Earth with high salinity. And get this. The whole project started when two researchers met for coffee and decided to try growing plants together. Well, isn't that nice? I suspect you're about to say, hey, but if you want to grow rice on Mars, you have to ship insane amounts of water from Earth, and it's not easy to quench this plant's thirst. You're right. You need about 449 gallons of water to only grow a pound of rice. But guess what? Scientists made a groundbreaking announcement at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in Texas. They found a relic glacier near Mars's equator. That's right, water ice on Mars, even near the equator. This is huge news and could mean there's even more ice just below the surface. It's not just any glacier, it's a relic glacier that's estimated to be 3.5 miles long and up to 2.5 miles wide. It's like the size of a small town. It's got all the features of a glacier, including crevasse fields and moraine bands. But get this, it's not actually ice. It's a salt deposit that formed on top of the glacier while preserving its shape. So, how did this salt deposit form? Well, it turns out that volcanic materials blanketing the region might have something to do with it. 
when these materials come into contact with water ice, sulfate salts may form and build up into a hardened, crusty layer. Over time, erosion removed the volcanic materials, exposing the sulfates and revealing the glacier's unique features. This glacier is young, likely from the Amazonian geologic period. That means that Mars has had surface ice in recent times. Who knows what other icy secrets Mars is hiding? But hold your horses, there's still more research to be done. Scientists need to figure out if there's still water ice preserved underneath the salt deposit, or if it has disappeared entirely. And if there is still water ice at shallow depths near the equator, that could have major implications for human exploration. Imagine being able to extract water from the ground at a warmer location. That would be a game-changer. So let's see what else these scientists uncover about our favorite red neighbor. Maybe someday, we'll even get to visit that salt glacier statue in person. See you next time!